you were talking about examples of submission that is sin. I wanted to ask you, because this happened to me, um, talking to another woman who was a believer, I noticed that she had started dressing in a way that seemed kind of immodest, and when I approached her about it, she said that her husband, who is also a believer, preferred that she dressed that way and she was submitting to him. And I was wondering if you could address that, because I'm sure she's not the only woman in that situation. Well, the, it, <laughs> all the other men enjoyed how she was dressing too, and it made it hard for them. And so the answer is no, sweetheart. But in private, I can do that. So, um, and just no, I'm not going to dress in a, in a modest or sensual way in public. Can you tell us how your husband was saved? I'm sorry? Can you tell us how your husband came to know the Lord? Well, he... <laughs> When I got saved, I didn't tell anybody. I mean, I didn't know what was happening. But I asked him if we could start going to church. And you know what he said. Okay. <laughs> and so he was a good person. And it's kind of a good person. And so we started going to church. My friend Katrina at work at the college started loaning me John MacArthur tapes. And so I was listening to them. I would listen to half a tape going to work and half the other half coming back. Back then, John MacArthur called his uh, flock beloved. And I'm just in the car by myself, me and John. And uh, he would say, now beloved. And then he would explain whatever he was talking about. And every time he would say, now, beloved, I would say, yes. <laughs> but anyway. <laughs> so Sanford got a hold of some tapes. And he started listening to them. And that's when the Lord saved him. So it was a few months later. Thank you. So in this uh, last talk that you did, when you say um, young women, you mean younger in Christ? Because uh, sometimes these women that we are called to, to fellowship with or minister to are like are older. There, um, uh, uh, good question. The Titus II woman is old. Uh, we can, I know some pastors say, well, you're older than somebody. Oh, those are the old women. But... <laughs> There's two issues. There are all age women that have been gifted uh, as exhorters, as teachers, just as Christian friends in the Lord. So, and there's a special place for the Titus II woman. So, it, it, if somebody's older than you and you're discipling them, biblical counseling is just discipleship. That's what it is. Now, sometimes, the problems are a little more complicated, but uh, that's what it is. And so the whether if it, you might have a Titus II relationship with a, a truly younger woman and you're working on those seven mandates with her, but um, the you might just be a sister in the Lord helping whomever, whatever age they are. Good question. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. What if the, your husband is just very passive and has asked you to lead in a way? Like, oh. for instance, um, maybe, they don't, maybe they don't. Well, if, if he's not, if, if he says he's a Christian and he's, he won't work, that's a, a sin. On, if he's able to work, that's a sin on his part. I would go to him privately 
uh, exhort him to repent, give God glory, use scripture, uh, and then as an interim, you might say, let's go together and talk to one of the pastors and let them hear both sides of our story. And um, if then if he says, no, I am not going, then you can say, well, well, I, I think it's a sin issue. So I am going and um, but I'm not going behind your back. I will tell you, you know, when the appointment is and you're welcome to come, <clears throat> that kind of thing. It may be he's lazy. It may be, maybe he really is not good with figures and finance and all that and you're better. And if he asks you to do that, it's okay to do it. But I would sit down every month with him and show him, okay, here, this is what I think we, the bills we should pay, you know, this month, and this is how much money we have, and um, include him in on that. Because some wives are better. I mean, I know one woman who's a certified a CPA, and she certainly outshines everybody in that. So if you're unsure, then um, make sure you're on firm ground with he's sinning. But a lot of the examples you gave, he probably would be sinning. Um, this is not for myself, but I know of a sister who... Uh, um, can you pull your mask down and yes, talk yes. to me? Thank you. Um, I know of a sister who has an unbelieving husband, and she has had trouble because, well, he has back problems, um, and he does not really, has not stepped up. Well, I don't know. She says that she, he has back problems, but he doesn't want to work also. So she doesn't know if it's because of his back, though sometimes she thinks it's not. What happens then um, if well, he doesn't want to work, and since he's not a Christian, like what is her responsibility in that? Well, kind of going off of what she was asking. Okay, if the husband uh, is physically impaired and he cannot work, um, I would ask uh, if the next time he went to the doctor, if I could just go with him, hear what the doctor says. But in a situation like that, uh, the wife may have to step up to the plate and work or go to the church uh, elders and say, uh, here's the situation, I've got five little kids under six years old, um, it, you know, can the church help us and handle it that way? Yeah, I'm done. Do it. All right. Sorry. <laughs> what if he, the doctor says that he has had a back problem, right? But he can work and he doesn't choose to work. What then? Well, then I would just say what you're doing is not right. And you need to, to stop and you need to get a job. Isn't there a song that says, get a job, get a job? Some, something like that. Do you know, do you have a job? Oh, good. Okay. All right. See, that's a plus if he's single and he has a job. Okay. I, I'm working on being more sensitive to not being um, too outspoken when my husband and I are in a group setting and talking over him. Um, talking too much, I mean, especially because he is a Christian and he's wise and he has good things to say and he can't say them if I'm talking. <laughs> so I'm wondering about when, if ever, it's appropriate. If I've noticed when I've been in a group setting that I've talked over him and stuff, then of course I know that it's right to go to him and to apologize and ask for forgiveness and repent. I'm wondering if it's ever right to go to the other people who were in the group and apologize to them. 
Like say Laura's had us over for dinner and I realized that in that setting of us four, I haven't had that quiet and submissive spirit. Is that ever right to address with Laura afterward, if that makes sense? Well, uh, in a situation like that, if you think you talked too much, th then I would go to my husband and, and ask him his thoughts. And you may even need to ask his forgiveness. I would ask him, do I need to go to our friends and ask their forgiveness? Um, he may say no, that's an overreaction. So I know I can, don't tell Sanford I said this, I can tell a story better than he can. And when he starts to tell it, I just, oh no. <laughs> But I just let the Lord deal with if he if they get the point of the story. <laughs> so, but see, he's smarter than I am, and that's an issue too because he he really uh, he really is smarter than I am. So he helps me out of a lot of jams. <laughs> so, yes. Um, I have a family member, and um, her she's a believing wife, and her husband is not. And he basically is sort of trying to manipulate her into having a mutual divorce. So whether it's because of guilt or um, maybe legal stuff, he doesn't want her, he wants her to basically um, agree to divorce. So what advice would you give for her because she's kind of in a situation where she's really, he's making it difficult for her in the marriage. And okay, so, he, w he wants a divorce. Um, it, it's very likely that he does want a divorce. Um, he's considered leaving in the past, um, and he's made it very clear that he doesn't want to be married to her, but um, he just, it, he won't actually um, make that decision, so. Well, there are two biblical grounds for divorce. One is adultery, and the other is uh, if the unbeliever doesn't want to live, continue living with the believer, especially because she is a believer, not because she drove him crazy, um, then let the unbeliever depart and the believing spouse is free. Uh, I would just be honest with him. If she doesn't have biblical grounds for divorce, then I, she should not file for divorce. But if she can tell him, I can't stop you from filing for divorce. A divorce is a lawsuit. And so I don't know what it is about these men. I, I, I mean, almost 90-something percent of them say they want a divorce, but they won't file. They want her to file. And I have a theory about that. The theory is most of them have a girlfriend on the side, and he wants to tell the girlfriend, who's not quite bright, uh, that, well, my wife won't give me a divorce. She, she can't stop him. I mean, it's a lawsuit. And so if he files for divorce, then she has 30 days to answer. And, you know, the lawyers go back and forth. So did I answer your question? <laughs> yeah, I think so. Or just, like, advice for her, like, because she's being put in this circumstance where he is wanting to divorce her and she doesn't want to make that decision. Um, yeah. Well, she should go to him and say, if this is what you want, then go ahead and uh, I can't stop you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, do you have any like practical advice um, when it comes to forgiveness and trust um, in which earlier you said 
they're different and how how to go about trusting that person again basically. oh okay um, the other person has to re-earn your trust it's their responsibility like if a husband is an alcoholic or he does drugs or he gambles or whatever and um, so, and he comes and asks his wife, will you forgive me? Well, the answer is yes, but then he needs accountability, he needs help, you know, with those issues. So, um, the, his, it's his responsibility to re-earn her trust if he has a problem with pornography and she, she finds out about it, he needs to repent and give God glory, but she does not need to be his accountability partner. That would just hurt her feelings if he had a failure in that area. So it needs to be somebody, a man, somebody else, you know, who will work with him. But um, it takes time to re-earn trust. But Jesus said, if your brother comes to you 70 times 7 and asks forgiveness, he told Peter that, then you, you say, I forgive you. But it doesn't mean you've, you're brain dead and you don't remember what happened. So it takes time. I t it's interesting. It's either back there or up here. I'm working out. Don't worry. <laughs> I have two of them. Going back to Miss Jackie's question, what happens if the, if the um, husband assumes that because you forgive him, he thinks you trust him as well? Uh, well, he'll find out. <laughs> <laughs> Would it be better to just tell him, I forgive you? But you have to gain my trust again? Well, you can say, I forgive you, but you need help. And depending on if he's a believer or an unbeliever, what, you know, the help that he would get. So she can make suggestions. Um, I know of one couple that uh, he was an alcoholic. And um, I think... Five or six years ago, she, she separated from him because his drinking was a big problem in the home and in the, with the children. And uh, he decided he would just stop drinking. And he hasn't had a drop to drink in five or six years. So she doesn't have to keep snooping around to see if he's hiding, you know, something. She doesn't need to be playing detective or police. Um, she just needs to be his wife and love him. Did I answer your question? Yes, the, my, my, it, the wife will figure out gradually over time. It, you know, it, she'll trust him more and more. Thank you. My second question was, you have an unbelieving husband and your old Christian wife, um, and your husband asks you to sin in a, man, in a way saying, um, um, do not talk to the children about Christ, and yet you said it's okay to do that when he's not around. Well, don't say, oh, I won't, I won't talk to them about the Lord. Don't commit to that. Just say, you're, you're asking me to sin by not talking to the children about the Lord, but I certainly don't have to do it when you're around because I know it's offensive. But is it sin? But wouldn't you be, the children most likely as are watching this, wouldn't they think you're somewhat hypocritical that when he's around you're not um, talking to them about Christ but, and he's, he told you not to, sinning, and yet you're doing it behind his back. Well, but you're not doing it secretly. You're not, you're not lying to him. 
And you're not saying, well, I won't talk to them about the Lord, and then you do it anyway. That would be deceitful, and that would be lying. The children, as they get older, are gonna, they're going to figure this out, that mom is a Christian and dad is not. And uh, if they come to her, and she should certainly be open to her children's questions, um, and say, why do you do this? Talk to us about the Lord when Dad's not here, but when he's around, you just say, well, what you did is not right, or I'm going to spank you now, or whatever. And um, once that, then she needs to tell him, because this is what the Bible says, to not offend your dad because he's an unbeliever, and we love him, and let's pray for him right now. Okay? All right, good question. um, We're not supposed to undermine your husband's authority, but if your husband is saying something that is not scripturally sound, you do not correct him in front of the children. He's speaking to the children, so what do you do? You just wait until you're just the two of you? and then go back to the children and say, well, actually, this is correct? Or do you wait for the husband to come and tell them that actually I was wrong? You you pray for wisdom. It's a judgment call. Thank you. Uh, You can, what you don't want to do is say, well, that's the stupidest thing I ever heard. And (laughs) just say, well, you might want to consider and then give your side of what you think is right. So I was trying to put this question in my mind in Spanish, but it's really hard. I mean, no, I speak English. It's just I always think in Spanish. I don't know. But um, so can a woman work all her life, a biblical, a a, a Christian woman work um, and outside of the home, not not a, I mean, she's obviously got two jobs for those of us who work, but um, can she be uh, seen as a biblical woman wife if she works outside of the home all her life or is it a requirement I don't know if I'm asking this correctly but is it like a requirement for the woman to actually seek to stay at home to take care of the home eventually or is it where she is to be seen like she has to get to that point one day in order to reach like the biblical wife position or can a woman just, you know, she can work outside of the home and, you know, she still takes care of the house and she still does what she needs to do in her marriage. I mean, I don't know. That's... Thanks a lot for <laughs> answering that question. Sorry, that's the last question. All right. Okay. The Bible says for the elder women to teach the younger women, and one of those mandates is to be a worker at home. All right. Biblically, I cannot say that she is sinning if she works. What if she's neglecting her children and neglecting her home? Then yes, that's a sin. For the most part, if possible, um, I would recommend that young women with small children uh, stay at home and try to live within the means of their budget. And a lot of times, if a, cu- if a couple has gotten themselves so much in debt with fancy cars or a boat or a house they can't really afford or in whatever, um, she and then he requires her to work because of, to pay the bills, to help pay the bills, then I would suggest that she make an appeal to him and say, you know what, I did some figures here, and if, we, if I didn't work, and if we downsize our house or sell this expensive car and just get a used car, whatever. Um, I would be more than willing to do that so that I can stay home with the children. So um, 
if she's working because she doesn't want to be a non-person and she wants to, she has that feminist heart like I used to have because I was on a, a roll with my education. In fact, uh, did I tell you about when I withdrew from my master's degree? Did I tell you all that now? Well, I, I got saved in June of that year. I had the summer off, but I was still taking night classes at Georgia State. I was halfway through my master's degree, and I was quickly convicted by God that I was neglecting my family. I mean, I really was. Working full-time, going to school at night, and all that. And so... I wrote a letter to the dean of the nursing department and I said I have become a Christian and the Lord Jesus is coming back and I don't have time for this program. <laughs> Withdraw me from the program. They did and I'm sure they're still laughing about it and the, the thing is I don't regret that. So it just depends on your circumstances. But um, in your heart, you want to have a heart for your family and your husband. And, uh, but if it's hard to do both, then because we have washers and dryers and dishwashers and stuff like that that back, you know, they didn't used to have. But the Bible does, it should be her heart. She shouldn't be lazy, and she should, uh, you know, be a helper suitable for her husband and uh, take care of her children. But as the children get older and older, they just don't need as much hands-on uh, as they used to. So, anyway, but she should talk to her husband about it. If she's convicting that she could do a better job being at home more than she needs to talk to her husband about it. The, every once in a while when I think about Jesus coming back, I, I'll think, Lord, please come on back so that some of those t professors at Georgia State that might still be alive <laughs> will say, oh, that's what she was talking about. Okay.